This is the Crowd Crux Crowdfunding Podcast with With Sal Sal Brigman, Brigman. where we cover everything you need to know to To launch launch a successful successful crowdfunding campaign. campaign. We speak with proven entrepreneurs who've raised money from the crowd and want to teach you how to do the same. Stay tuned because we're about to reveal how to launch your dream project with your host, Sal Brigman. Before we get started with this podcast episode, I want to take a second to introduce you to my friends at FulfillRight. If you need help shipping out your Kickstarter or Indiegogo perks or rewards, FulfillRight is the absolute best company for you. I've been working with them for a while and I can vouch for their services. They make it dead simple and take all of the headache out of shipping out all of those boxes, all of those orders to your backers and your customers. If you want to check them out, go to fulfillright.com at F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E.com. What up, crowdfunder? Salvador Brigman here. Welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. On this show, we talk about crowdfunding, how to raise money, Indiegogo, Kickstarter, equity crowdfunding, all that kind of stuff. We also talk about nonprofit fundraising. We talk about um, real estate crowdfunding sometimes. Um, So there's a lot of elements of crowdfunding that we try to get into. And it's been my goal since I first got into this industry um, since 2012 to demystify this process for you, to get into the nitty gritty of how do you launch one of these campaigns? How do you raise money? What's happening behind the scenes? I really try to make this all easy and step-by-step for you uh, and put this into my guide, the Kickstarter launch formula. So one of the questions I get very common is like, okay, Sal, um, I know you talk a lot about Kickstarter. Do you actually work for them? No, I don't work for them. Uh, And then the second question is like, okay, well, what about Indiegogo? Because I've also heard about that crowdfunding website. And um, Indiegogo is awesome. Like I, I do talk about them on this show I do talk about them in my YouTube channel and my blog, CrowdCrux. Uh, But basically, also in the Kickstarter launch formula, I cover Indiegogo. And I also go into the differences between Kickstarter and Indiegogo for those of you out there. So, you know, this this is a website that is every single day having successful campaigns, is always bringing in new innovations and new technology. And there are clear benefits to Indiegogo over Kickstarter in many ways. So today, I wanted to interview a entrepreneur who actually raised money successfully on Indiegogo who's done a six-figure raise on Indiegogo, um, over $138,000. So you're going to hear from him today, and we're going to get into his strategy, how he was able to do this, um, how they were able to actually create this product, what that is, a little bit of that kind of um, information. I think you're going to like that today. Now, the other thing I want to mention is, um, for those of you who are looking for more of a guide, and um, you know, you've know you been listening maybe to one or two of my episodes, you're like, okay, I, I get this, that people are still working, this crowdfunding thing, people are raising money every single day there's a system behind this like let me i need to know a little bit more about this um i have a great starting point for you which is the kickstarter launch formula so this book i put together i wrote it's the culmination of since 2012 all of my knowledge information strategies techniques a lot of really good stuff um, that will help you and dramatically improve your results if you launch a campaign on indiegogo or on kickstarter so you can go to crowdcrux.com slash kickstarter audio and you can grab a audible version of this book. That is C-R-O-W-D, C-R-U-X dot com slash Kickstarter audio. Crowdcrux.com slash Kickstarter audio. That's a great starting point. Um, other starting points would be check out some of the other podcasts here, some of the other episodes that I put out. Go check out my YouTube channel um, or my blog. And also, if you want to do one- one-off coaching, I'll share at the end of this podcast episode how you can book me for a one-off coaching session. I think you guys are going to like this episode, particularly if you've created a physical product and are wondering how to raise six figures on Kickstarter. It's coming up right after this. Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. Today we're talking with a successful Indigo campaign owner who's raised over $100,000 off of a $50,000 goal. Nine days left to go. Um, this product is also really unique. It's a smart padlock, um, which I'll let him tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, and also I want to get into when it comes to Indiegogo, how does this compare to Kickstarter and some of the other crowdfunding platforms that are out there? Matthew, welcome to the show. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you, Salvador. Do you think you could tell uh, the listeners a little bit about the product that you've created, who it's for, um, what does it do, what can they use it for? 
Yeah, so we uh, at Igloo Home uh, have created a smart padlock that we're launching hopefully in the Q1 of 2019. So um, what it's for is uh, it's writing off of what we already do successfully with our other locks and security products. Um, where our company started about three years ago, uh, back in August of 2015, and long story short is we made uh, smart access easy by using you know uh, algorithms instead of uh, connecting by Wi-Fi to create codes from the cloud using the mobile app. So given the success we've had with Airbnb and other places, uh, people really gravitated towards our product and say, hey, um, you know, it's great to have a door lock, but I don't need a door lock. I wanted to secure my bike. I wanted to secure, uh, you know, a shed. Uh, we actually had some logistics company reach out to us and say, hey, we were looking for a better, more secure solution in a form of a padlock. So, you know, that's how we jumped into it and said we weren't sure. And so uh, we, we were, you know, we were doing a lot of stuff around the entryways with our key box, with our uh, two other door locks. But we're like, okay. And so we studied it a bit, and that was one of the – one of the reasons why we wanted to go on Indiegogo mm. uh, since we had been around already, we, we, we got a pretty good idea from it. Yeah. So did you, did you join the company? Were you, were you there at the very beginning or like when did you come into the project? Um, so this particular smart padlock uh, project, uh, we started about over six months ago. I would okay. say conversations even before that. I've been with the company since the uh, end of 2016, actually. So over two years. Um, so yeah, I was doing other, other, uh, things with the company, uh, on the product management and business development side, but this particular project, uh, I, I run it and I run the product team that actually, uh, you know, put yeah, it together. Yeah. So. Uh, when, when it comes to the company, you know, I think we all have like an idea of a traditional product launch. Like you're, you're creating a product, you sell it online, uh, but crowdfunding is like a little bit different. Why did you guys want to go that route instead of doing something like on your own website? I think uh, we just we were curious to do it actually for other products that we had, but we were already in the market and to say come up with a new version of the same thing to put it on Indiegogo. I didn't I didn't feel that it was the right I guess strategy because people already know it and it's like oh it's not really a novel or new thing, but for us the padlock when we looked at the marketing landscape and just the competitors what everybody's doing I said no I think we have something a little bit different to offer. Is this really the right feature sets that people are looking for? Um, is this the right price point? Um, we just thought it was a great way to get earlier exposure and getting a lot more feedback from you know just the general public. Yeah. Um, I, I think that that's 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 why we went ahead and said you know it's it's, it's a good place to, to do it and launch it. When it, when it comes to uh, crowdfunding, I think like the two big players in the room are obviously Kickstarter and Indiegogo. I think a really big question in everyone's mind is like, should I go with Indiegogo? Should I go with Kickstarter? You know, so many different um, elements there. What made you decide to choose Indiegogo for your campaign? Um, I, I think I can't say exactly it's, this is the right approach, but I mean, we just felt you know, Indiegogo had a different uh, proposition in terms of like the the amount of money that's required on the fees. And also we had worked with a, an agency that kind of helped us. And I think for this particular project, we just went with what, what, what our agency had, you know, teamed up with us to do. We might ultimately do another project coming up later after we launched Padlock and do it as well on Kickstarter. So we kind of see the variation between the two as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other difference there being like fixed versus flexible goals uh, and being right. able to keep the money that you raise. Exactly. That, that's also. And I guess another part of it is um, if you look, we already have, had been on their marketplace side for our, our existing products. So it just kind of felt natural to just start with Indiegogo right away as well. Um, so when, it, when it, you mentioned an agency working with you, um, how, how did you like stumble across those guys? Because I know a lot of listeners are really eager and like interested in like, OK, how do we find one of these agencies, you know, that that can help with products? Yeah, that's that's a search you know, process in itself, because, you know, you, you have to look at the references for the type of projects that they've done. Is it in the similar industry? You know, is it the similar size of goals that you, you know, that we were, we were looking towards for our campaign? Um, you know, the, the types of uh, early comments and insights that they have. And ultimately, I think um, one main thing is uh, media reach. 
you know, the type of companies that they're in connection with in terms of uh, exposure that they can give us and connect, connecting us to, to the right media channels besides just us floating it out there and hopefully, you know, it does well. Yeah. Uh, so when it comes to your, your fundraising, so like you, you basically surpassed your goal almost like 300%. So you're overfunded. You still have nine days to go here. Uh, how, how are people discovering you on the platform? Like, are people coming that are naturally searching Indiegogo? Is this from like an email list you built or ads? Like, how are people finding you? I, everything you mentioned there, you know, I think there's no such thing as a, uh, it's insufficient, you know, marketing. I think you just have to keep going and anywhere you get exposure, you, you do it. But uh, we did find that there are, there is a lot of organic uh, generation of leads um, a lot of people from this particular campaign have reached out to us uh, that are not necessarily in the, um, uh, 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 let's say, B2C channel. And they, they actually came back and said, hey, you know, we, we actually see applications for some of your products on B2B side as a project. So so it, 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 it just comes, you know, out of the woodwork in some ways. It's not magic, but it's just added together. With other stuff we've done on Facebook, we we had other uh, places we had write ups. We just you know, do email blasts, everything you know, just just compiles together to to formulate those marketing plan. So w- what do you mean by that exactly? So I know you know B two B versus B two C. Are you saying that like basically other companies are looking to partner with you as a result Correct. of? Correct. So you know I think when we look at this padlock, we're like we're not sure if it's a consumer only product. You know, we had a lot of companies that actually, you know, uh, storage companies actually came out and said, hey, you know, we want to use this for our, our, our people that are uh, customers that are renting, you know, uh, a space from us that, you know, have to supply their own padlock. But in this case, we can kind of put it in our package and, and give them smart access without having to wait for them to, have, you know, buy their own padlock. And it was an, a unique kind of selling point. So we're still in talks with those kind of companies now. Uh, it's very early because the product's not out yet. Um, that that was one. Another was, was a, uh, a retailer that was looking to secure uh, a lot of their facilities and, and their locations, and so that was one that we wouldn't have thought if we weren't on any go go that we could you know uh, uh, reach. If we just walked up to them, we would, they wouldn't you know necessarily we would know they'd have a need and they wouldn't have known that this product existed. The the other thing you get feedback on is like your pricing, because I mean you're putting this product out there into the world. Obviously, you can connect with retailers, you can connect with other potential like business leads and such. But you also get like direct feedback on your pricing and whether or not people like it. You know, they can leave comments. That is true. I mean, um, the the packages that we have up there, you know, the, the list price is one hundred nine uh, as the uh, list price, and then it goes all the way down with the perks and early bird specials. Um, it's sixty nine plus shipping for one so and then we did two for 129 so it's just a good way to see where people kind of take uh, uh the product on most people probably just you know take one but you know for us to kind of just get some attention i think we you know we wanted to have a different packages out there as well to have a selection did you did you find anything to be surprising about this launch? Like, did you guys think you would raise, you know, one hundred thirty seven thousand? Um, did you think that people would gravitate to the rewards that they did? Was there anything surprising about the launch? Um, I, I would say the organic uh, leads that we get. I think we weren't expecting that. Like, it, I don't say it blew up, but but this um, is not necessarily from the channels that we were getting uh, a lot of feedback from. Um, the, the ramp up was quite fast in the first week and that was good. So that, that was, you know, something we were hoping for, you know, but it, but it happens and it obviously is still a nice surprise. Yes. What about any other like channels? Like, did you end up getting, um, on any media channels or, um, any other companies picking you up that way? Or did you even, did you try to have a strategy when it comes to that? Um, we, we left that a lot with our media uh, partners, our agencies. So um, we're still looking to, I, you know, it's, it's ongoing process. Totally, um, yeah. The only drawback, I would say, is when we launched this product, actually, um, it was that it's the same time when Google made their announcement at their uh, conference. So obviously there's a lot of attention being spread out. So we're still trying to, you know, work our way through that, you know, attention span and, and, and then hopefully we'll get, gather more from, from the follow-up. Here. Wait, what was the Google announcement? 
I think all the Google Home Hub, um, uh, they had a bunch of new, 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 uh, the, the, the phone, the Google Pixel 3. You know, oh, you can't really okay. compete, you can't compete with the phone that, you know, a major flagship phone that just came out for the year. So, yeah, yeah that's true. So that, that can seem to get a little bit of attention there. Um, so, yes. so basically, like, for you, I, I mean, this is kind of a dumb question, but you're basically like the VP of product. So that means that you've put a lot of thought into the actual designing of this product. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, I mean, um, I come from a security background, so I've worked a lot with different types of padlocks, uh, mechanical ones over the last you know, 10, 15 years. So um, given you know what we could do as a company at Eagle Home and the technology that we had you know, on our, at our disposal, it was just really nice to, to be able to deploy this technology in this product because there are no uh, ones that existed before in a pin code format with algorithm codes that you can create remotely without being next to the lock. A lot yeah. of them, you have to be next to it, you know, or they just don't have this feature at all. I had to interrupt this podcast episode because I want to introduce you to my friends at The Gadget Flow. Their product discovery platform reaches 22 million people per month They've helped more than 5,000 crowdfunding campaigns thus far, and they have a social media following of more than 700,000 followers. If you want to gain access to their marketplace and list your own product, you can go to thegadgetflow.com slash submit and list your project today. Well, when it comes to the whole designing phase, so like you have this, I'm sure you're having brainstorming sessions and you're like, okay, what if we had all these different benefits that we put into the product? And there's, I'm sure also discussions of like, oh, we have to leave this out or can we technologically do this? What, what is that step-by-step -step process like? Like from, from the beginning of having this idea to getting the product launch, what, what was that timeline kind of like? So um, we started this process of, of the idea of the padlock, like I said, over six months ago, we really delved into it about, I would say, four months when we started, you know, just listing out uh, the uh, product requirement documents and, and looking at the overall space in terms of uh, competition or other brands that are doing it. Um, sizes, you know, there's just different types of sizes for different uses, um, the type of protection you want on the padlock. Um, I think some U USPs, that we thought unique selling points that we thought uh, could trigger a lot of interest. Obviously, we wanted to make it a, a good looking because that's something that I think people still appreciate. It's, it's a nice design product. They don't want them something useful, but they want to have you know so whether it's a very utilitary product or commodified product like a padlock. They you know there's still a lot of appreciation for design. Um, the whole process I would say started with you know just us internally you know two three of us. Uh, graphic designer, product manager, and myself to say, hey, this is what we see. These are the colors. These are the materials. Um, they, they, they don't really fit what we do because, you know, we're trying to put a, a pin code system inside a padlock. You know, a lot of them, you know, the traditional rotary dials, um, I say that's not what we, we have. So to put up front and center to have a nine-digit pin code, it, it looked a little bit traditional, yet it's still very modern. And, and, and it fit our, our kind of uh, branding as well. Um, the colors that we use, we, we with a metal gray. I thought it, it looked sturdy. It looked you know durable. Um, it wasn't too overly metallic and shiny, um, and, and it looked like it fit well in with the rest of the portfolio of our lineup as well. So, um, and then we went in. Of course, did, did we go you know do a lot of concept art? A lot of uh, drawings back and forth by hand, you know, and then we come fin finally to a, a, a right initial design. Then that's just the outlook. Then we went in and looked at other features like, uh, you know, we have a backlight LED, how we can implement that. That was quite a challenge as well because initially we went, wanted to have buttons that were uh, plastic. But I'm like, no, that doesn't make sense to have a, a plastic or rubberized buttons if it's a security product, you know, you can't have it where people could drill into the keypad, right? Yeah, yeah. So, right. So, so we went through another whole month or so just looking at what ways we can implement an a, a entirely metal body and metal keypad and, 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 and uh, buttons. Because we looks, are all. It yeah. looks really slick, too, I was going to say. Well, yeah, thank you. That's the thing that we wanted to, to, to uh, kind of get across from looking at the product. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you know, then we go into the internals, the guts of it, the, the, the mechanisms that make it open and unlock and lock. Um, 
So it, it's it's then you know we have an industrial designer that we work with, and we went to at least six different mechanical internal mechanical designs to come to one that we are very comfortable with. Because um, obviously there are international standards you have to follow for the security side of it as well. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of technical you know regulatory um, designs, Issues, yeah. functional challenges. Yes. So I think, number one, um, it's really interesting that you can get things like um, integration with Airbnb, Booking Sync, and like other apps. You can have customization of access. You can see access logs. Like that's that's really neat that you can do that. Uh, and I think that's really valuable also for someone who wants to like, if they're using this for Airbnb or they're using this for a storage unit, you can see when this is being accessed and like all that kind of stuff. Um, the other question I had here though was like, you, it, the way that it looks, it does all of these really neat and like really cool things, but I'm sure there were a lot of prototypes that happened before you got to that final stage. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Cause it, it looks so, you know, finished, like fully a fleshed out polished products, but I'm sure that there were stages either with 3d printing or molding. Like, can you talk a little bit about the prototyping that went into this? Yeah. Um, well, it's nice that we have uh, in, in, in Asia, we have two offices. We have our Singapore headquarters, and then we have our supply chain uh, side uh, where we have an, uh, about you know 15 staff running there in Shenzhen. So that is a blessing because I guess compared to other uh, hardware companies, maybe they're going through an intermediary or they have to travel quite a bit to work with uh, uh, contract manufacturers, prototyping companies to get their uh, uh, samples, you know, uh, uh, up to speed but for us it was quite a seamless process because we we're physically there all the time every day we have office so it just made life a lot easier um even though i you know i'm based in california i have to travel a bit but it's okay um so so i think i think um the iterations that we went through um uh, to speak on what you're asking i think i think what it was is just looking in and, and looking at the initial design making the the, the early prototypes um, and not c- commit ourselves to a certain look until we actually saw, you know, different stages of design. We, I think we went to f- six drafts of the, the CAD design of, of the me- mechanism and then four physical samples, you know, that we kept fine tuning and fine tuning. And that's why it took us nearly eight months to get to this point. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of iterations there. And also imagine yes. just getting a sense of like, what is the size of this thing going to be? How is this going to feel in your hand? All those like little things you don't really think about, but that really go yes. into a product design. Yeah. One thing I, I really liked that I, I, I'd say I really pushed for was initially the back of the padlock. Um, it was very flat and square. It would just round from the front face that you look at it now. But I was really looking to, to, to make it curved in the back. And that was a design challenge because you have a lot of components inside without making it too thick. Because I wanted to feel like, you know, when you're holding it in your hand, it's like almost like you're holding an egg. So that was a very ergonomic feel. And so you see a lot of our images, we show the product being hold, held in hand, especially when it's uh, latched onto something that's a natural motion. And then you would use your thumb to, you know, go across the keypad. And I think that whole, you know, uh, user, user experience uh, is something maybe when they actually use it would be, be something that, that a lot of people would appreciate. Because when we had a, a more cornered backside, the whole thing's metal, um, it, you know, it, it just felt not as natural. So, so those kind of little things were, 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 were some of the, the, the changes we made over time. A lot of the stuff that happens behind the scenes. I'm speaking to the crowdfunders in the audience who have already launched a Kickstarter campaign. We've actually even successfully run a campaign. And the reason is, I think you will understand this pain point most. And that is, when you finally do raise money on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, The hardest part is not collecting the cash. The hardest part is shipping out all of those perks and rewards to your backers. It is a nightmare, my friends. It's a lot of spreadsheets, it's a lot of headache, and it's a lot of stress. That's why I recommend BackerKit. If you have not heard of BackerKit, they help you collect surveys, they help you collect data, and the entire fulfillment process is just so much easier and so many less spreadsheets when you use their software. You can check them out at backerkit.com and use CrowdCrux for a special discount. Uh, I'm curious here. So I think you've had a, a very successful campaign, incredibly um, beautiful product. 
Um, would you have done anything differently with the launch specifically? Would you have um, spent more time on, you know, gathering emails or spent more um, on advertising or anything like that? Would you have done anything differently with the launch? Um, no, I think it, I can't say it was perfect, but I think what we've implemented so far, we're very happy with. Um, obviously, I would say one of the challenges is getting the right videos. Luckily, we had a, a very excellent um, a videographer, a video company that was experienced in this space doing a lot of these campaign videos. So they came up with a lot of marketing assets for us that you see on the page um, that was very useful. Um, but I would say if I had to change something, we would have done it earlier because it was quite a rush and they did it in less than, I would say, the whole turnaround time from less the script to the the actual finished video and shooting everything and selecting the talent, it was less than a month. Which oh, is wow, that's really wow. fast. Yeah, and we did it mostly all you know in a day or two shooting, and I would say within five days of you know a couple rounds of edits. Oh my! So we didn't know. Yeah, I would say that was quite a, a rush, but it was a lot of work. That must have but, been like sixteen-hour days, twelve-hour days there. I think more for the videographer than us, but I mean, we're the ones looking at the edits and going back and forth a bit, but, but it was a, it came out okay, but that we should have planned it a little bit, you know, further in advance, but it's tough because we didn't have the right road prototypes. We couldn't do it two months in advance of the campaign, you know? Mm. So um, we literally got the video in like a week before the campaign launched. So that was quite, quite, quite a tight schedule. That would, that would have changed a little bit of that deadline around. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just have one or two more questions for you. Um, yes. One also, I want to I want to get a sense of you. You know, having designed this product, and now it's going to be in the hands of people around the world. Um, people have seen your video. They've seen your work. What What does that feel like? You know, I'm sure you've you've obviously created products before, but having this like very public nature of it and the designs into it, what does it feel like as a as a product designer? Well, I think it's very validating. Uh, for one, it's very satisfying. I mean, it's just, you're, you're not making this just for yourself. You want you there's a use case for it, and having people you know uh, support and back the campaign, that helps to say, hey, this is what we were looking for. You know, we get a lot of emails and say, hey, um, how else can we cooperate from what we see with you on Indiegogo? So that that gives us a lot of traction, a lot of uh, motivation to keep going. Um, especially, like I said, we, we weren't sure, you know, a padlock is a thing that we wanted to do considering the range we already had, especially, you know, when you mentioned the Airbnb aspect, it's great that it's there, but it's not necessarily going to be fully useful for this particular use. You know, maybe some niche, like particular special kind of, uh, uh listing that doesn't use a door lock, maybe, but, um, it, this gives us a lot of, uh, uh, exposure that, that we, we were very happy with. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, also, when it comes to doing this Indiegogo campaign, is this something you guys are going to do, you think, in the future as a new way to release products? Um, or is this kind of just like a trial test and, and we'll see what, what will happen in the future? No, definitely we will explore it again um, with our next product. I think, uh, it, obviously, you know, we, we're not sure. This is the place to put it on to see, you know, to, to, to see if you move forward or not. Um, so, so yes, I would say crowdfunding is definitely a, a channel that we, we like to use because we were using a lot of distribution before and with distribution, what we see is that, uh, you know, our, our buyers or, or, or importers, people that are marketing their local respective characters around the world, they need the product first in their hand before they make any buying decisions on an inventory. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a little bit different. So I think this helps to give them some confidence and say, hey, look at all the people buying into this product. So that helps us to, to get our existing partners on board for the distribution side as well. It's it's so interesting too, because like if you're gonna buy a traditional product on Amazon, it's gonna be like there in two days or like you know, five days at most. Versus like with a crowdfunding campaign, you there's gonna be a lead time here. Like there's gonna be 30 days, 60 days, 90 days before this actually shows up on someone's doorstep. It's like a completely yeah, they, different model in that way. Yeah, uh, you know, actually for us, we like the fact that there is extra time and, and it forces us to, to plan ahead for all the assets we have now, which are, you know, I would say still we're three months away from, from launch, let's say, our pre-production, uh, hopefully we'll have it in, you know, uh, uh, every, all the tooling, everything done, the, the final, final prototypes from production assembly point of view, uh, I would say that would happen in, in December. So now we're in November, we still have a good, you know, 
35, 45 days of just a lot of marketing groundwork that we can plant, mm-hmm. you know. So, so we appreciate that that this helps us to plan better as well because normally we would do it the other way where we have the product first and we take everything else, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, in terms of the marketing side after the products uh, are born. Well, you shared a ton of great, I think, strategies and information in the interview today. Um, did you have anything else? Like if for, for the person listening right now, um, they're in the beginning stages of their campaign. They're right now planning to do a crowdfunding launch. Um, do you have anything, any words of wisdom, further words of wisdom to impart or just uh, maybe a word of encouragement or a final tip um, to end on? Um, yeah, I would say videos are the most important. So you do have to invest, whether you don't have to actually have a company help you do it, but you should have a video and um, that helps you get the message across very simply to make sure that you have the right, I guess, uh, value proposition for your product and help organize your thoughts. Um, that, that, that's one of the main things. I would say, you know, just, just do it. I mean, the third thing, um, you don't know, if, you know how much you need, but you do have to set up aside some budget. And it's not just, you know, you have a product, you put a picture page on it and you put some words and, and, and it, it'll naturally grow. There is a process in place to kind of uh, uh, organize and, and create the campaign itself. And so it's not like one person is doing it. It's a whole team of us uh, uh, running this campaign and, and then create, creating the products. So I would say um, don't overlook that, uh, oh, you know, success just comes naturally. It's, it's, it's a planned process, I would yeah. say. Hard work. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on the in, uh, the podcast. I think that um, you know your your product is really interesting, and I think we're going to see even more and more like smart devices just showing up. Not only with like locks and stuff, but other areas of our house. I think you guys kind of have carved out a niche when it comes to you know security items there, um, and I think it'll be really neat to watch some of your progress there. So thank you for for coming on the show, and uh, we'll have to have you back. Thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here and sharing. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. My name is Salvador Brigman. I hope you've been enjoying not only this show, but also some of the other episodes that I have out there on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Spotify. A lot of great places to consume this show. I also put out um, shows, usually a little bit older shows, on my YouTube channel on my YouTube channel. So if you're interested in um, gaining access to that, you can go to my YouTube channel, just search my name, Salvador Brigman on YouTube, and that will come up. But um, my goal here, number one is education, of course. Number two, a fun learning environment. (laughs) A fun learning environment. You know, we always listen to really boring business speakers, I think, and really business boring, boring business lecturers. People who are just like droning on and on and on. And um, it's not really fun. It's, there's no personality to it. So I also want you to enjoy your listening experience with this podcast. Um, and finally, this is sort of the beginning part, I think, of getting ready and deciding whether or not crowdfunding is for you. And if you're already starting to get there, that feeling like, yeah, you know, I really want to launch one of these campaigns. Like, I have an idea. Maybe I even have a prototype. I've been sketching this together. Like, I want to take action on this. Um, a good next step is to book me for a one-off coaching session. So one-off coaching session with Sal. Uh, Basically, uh, you'll be able to pick my brain when it comes to your specific project, getting into what is going to be a good strategy for you. Um, How is your product going to fit with Kickstarter? What are you going to have to do to get funded in order to get traffic? All these different things. What are some service providers or some websites you should be looking into or be on your radar? also looking and reviewing your project uh, and, and giving you some feedback there and like what has to be changed or what has to happen to put this in the right position. It's, it's a very inexpensive way um, to get started and you get a lot of value for that. And also you're, you get to network with me a little bit and if you want me to work on your campaign in a larger way, um, or do other stuff like promotion, etc. cetera. Um, that's also a conversation that we can have. But even if you don't, I, I really designed the one-off coaching sessions to be incredibly value-packed for you. I want to make sure that you come away from that feeling confident, feeling good. Um, so if that sounds interesting to you, you can go to crowdcrux.com slash coaching. That is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X dot com slash coaching. Go there, enter your name and email address, give me a little bit of information about your project, what category you're going into, um, you know, how did you come up with this idea? What, what, what is like the fundraising goal that you're anticipating? 
giving me a little bit of information so I can study up um, for our coaching call and then we can get started. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. It is listeners just like you um, that make me want to come to work every day. I love working with new products and also hearing some of the feedback from some of the listeners. So thank you so much and I hope you enjoy some of the other episodes out there.